in March, two months before, we all went to um, photographers in the city centre. And there was mom and dad and the four children. We all had our photograph taken as, as a family group. That's the photograph there. Yeah. Pass it over and I'll show you. Yeah. That's my dad. He was only 33. So this is the last it, photograph. It's the only photo, family photograph we have. Where are you? I'm at the back with a sticky out hair. Yeah. <laughs> I was eight. But I love that photograph. I've got, right, I'm exactly. carrying one with me, a small one in my purse. <laughs> you carry it with you all the time? Yes, yeah, in my purse, yes. Yeah. June's story gets to the heart of one of the main reasons we love the Spitfire. It's a physical reminder of the sacrifices people made during the war, the tragic side of the Spitfire story. We're leaving the Midlands now, just as MH434 did in 1943, when it was delivered by air to RAF Hornchurch in Essex. It was flown by one of the Air Transport Auxiliary, or ATA, pilots. They delivered more than 300,000 aircraft, despite being unarmed and without radio communication. They were sent to bases right across the country. All of them were volunteers, and one in five of them were women. Among them, a 20-year-old, Joy Lofthouse. You ask anyone of the single engines which was their favorite, and it would be a Spitfire. I've heard someone say you only had to blow on the stick and it did what you wanted. It was the nearest thing to flying oneself. It was almost as though the wings were, were part of you, not part of the aeroplane. I was 60 and a half when war broke out. I'd never seen an aeroplane, leave alone been in one. Several of my boyfriends said, oh, you're joining ATA. Are you going in as a driver or something? And I said, no, they're teaching me to fly. And of course, a lot of them didn't want to believe it, uh, as I'd never been in an aeroplane before. You must remember we were young. When you think what the youngsters do now, a lot of jumping out of aeroplanes and bungee jumping, uh, nothing seemed dangerous, nothing seemed out of our abilities, if you like. I never remember being instructed on how to use a parachute. We were usually taught forced landing was the better way. If the engine cut, try to save the aeroplane if you can by making as good a forced landing as you could. Don't be a bleeding hero, just try to get it down safely. If you knew you were near an American airfield, you would always choose that partly because they were full of admiration for us flying, and the food was better in the mess, you got a good lunch, and also they would take you to the PX, which was their equivalent of Naffy, their shop, and uh, there they would let you buy lipstick and chocolate and stockings. The proudest achievement of my life, obviously, uh, was flying the Spitfire, being allowed to fly this aircraft which everyone knew about had sort of saved the country in the Battle of Britain, and I was allowed to fly it. I don't think I could do anything that would make me prouder than that. It, there's a story that even when he could, couldn't subdue us in the Battle of Britain, Hitler got cross with Goering and said, what do you want to wipe out this air force? And Goering said, a squadron of Spitfires. Joy tells her story so charmingly that you could easily forget just how much nerve it took climbing into a Spitfire with so little experience in the middle of the war. And at which you found it difficult to fly the Spitfire? Well, I don't think so. I think the Spitfires are delight to fly. I think as long as you follow the basic rules of, you know, opening the throttle slowly on takeoff and treating the aeroplane with respect, it's actually a delight to fly. So the only thing she would have difficulty with, I suppose, would be the prejudice of some of the male pilots who would have thought a girl couldn't do a thing like that. Exactly, and I, I thought there was a little bit of that, but um, probably laid to rest when, uh, you know, a Spitfire arrived out of the gloom on a foggy day and a, and a young lady stepped out of it. Well, a lot of the pilots would have liked that, wouldn't they? Yeah, quite right. MH434 was delivered to RAF Hornchurch in Essex, where it became the favorite plane of an ace South African airman, Flight Lieutenant Pat Lardner-Burke. He had already established a reputation as a top-class fighter pilot when he received his brand new Mark IX Spit. 
He reveled in being center stage in battle, but he was less keen on the limelight in peacetime. Remarkably, his children are only finding out now, 40 years after his death, what an extraordinary man their father was. When did you first see all the stuff that your father had? Uh, was probably only about two months ago. Really? Well, I've always known that it's, uh, you know, it's been in the family, but uh, my mother, as, as a good a hoarder as she was, she generally had it, all of this stuff was boxed up and kept in the attic. This is an amazing treasure trove, isn't it? What are we... What is this? Well, I think here you have got the, uh, the seat for the Spitfire, uh, and this is the, the, the parachute, named oh. as Squadron Leader Ladnerberg, so... So it's written on ready it. Ready to go. So he would have been flying Spitfires at that time. You'd have to look after that, yeah. right. We've got his boots, haven't we? It's the flying boots. I understand the idea of these was that the fur part was detachable, so that they could actually, if they were shot down over the continent, they would detach this part of the, the boot or the top part, so that they could then just walk out and pretend that they were a, a French civilian, possibly. And walk their way to Switzerland, if they were Hopefully, lucky. yes. Yeah. Now, well, this is the famous helmet. This is the proper... This is, this the is what we all helmet, about. yes. When we yes. think of a Spitfire pilot, we yeah. think of them wearing one of these. Well, this is, I can promise you this is original. Yeah, um, yeah, the goggles. The goggles, the, uh, the oxygen mask. What's it like for you, seeing this equipment, that your father, that your father had? It has uh, reignited our father's memory. That's your dad there, isn't it? It is, yes. That is yeah. Natal Squadron, Treble Two Squadron, uh, based at Hornchurch, and he would have been flying 434. So these would be his flying mm -hmm. friends, and that's, that's him. Looks as if he's alongside a Spitfire, doesn't it? Uh, it does, yes, that's certainly him. This is the 222 Squadron. And where is he in the picture? Sitting on the front row, seated with uh, Seems to have the squadron dog in front of him. Squadron dog. He seems to be keen on dogs. <laughs> he does, dogs, yes. It, yeah. We never saw any of that in later life. Do you wish you could have asked him about the war when you knew him? I would say that we actually spoke very little about it, um, if at all. Um, he certainly wasn't going to start discussing the war with his young children, so um, very, very little. He died when I was 14, so I, I do feel that perhaps we would have... Uh, a little, if I was a little older and, you know, we'd have had a pint of beer in a pub, I think maybe we could have spoken about it, but as, as we were children, it, it was never discussed. Martin never had the chance to talk to his dad about the war, but his father's logbook reveals that this was really where they played with fire, the English Channel. Our Spitfire marshaled the skies over this strip of sea. It provided cover for Allied bombers heading for German targets in France. Within three weeks of our Spitfire being built, it was in action against the Luftwaffe. And for seven, of some of the most difficult months of the war in 1943, this aircraft was right in the thick of it. And you can imagine what it'd be like streaking out over the channel as we are now. And at any moment, you could be hit by German raiders. In fact, you were hoping to meet German raiders. Your job was to defend England. Martin has allowed me to read the logbook and also 222 Squadron's operational flying diary.